Wake up now, open your eyes Through the circuits and the fire And see reality As it wasn't meant to be Human skin and silver Warning, this video contains material that some viewers may find disturbing. All original source material is in the description below. Viewer discretion advised. I finally read the book at a lie with statistics by Daryl Huff. Originally published in 1954, 70 years ago. And it is kind of still relevant today. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. This video is sponsored by you, the viewer. I've had a sponsor before. I didn't like it, so I'm not sponsored, nor am I monetized anywhere. So anything I do make comes from you. So if you like what I do and you want to support the cause, you can shoot me a tip or support to my PayPal, Venmo, Cash App below. Or you can join my Patreon or check out my merch store. I know that I've already mentioned this book before because Bill Gates had it on a list of his good reads from 2015. From Gates Notes, the blog of Bill Gates, Guide to Number Games. I don't lie, with statistics is a great introduction to a crucial topic by Bill Gates. March 14, 2015. I picked this one up after seeing it on the Wall Street Journal list of good books for investors. It was first published in 1954, but it doesn't feel dated. Aside from a few anachronistic examples, it has been a long time since bread cost five cents a loaf in the US. In fact, I'd say it's more relevant than ever. One chapter shows you how visuals can be used to exaggerate trends and give distorted comparisons. It's a timely reminder, given how often infographics show up in your Facebook and Twitter feeds these days. And the last sentence is quoted on the last edition printed of the actual book. A great introduction to the use of statistics and a great refresher from anyone who's already well versed in it. Every summer, I try to do a little extra reading. Here's a few books I've read recently that you might enjoy. How to Lie with Statistics by Daryl Huff. Being able to understand what you're looking at and being willing to say, hey, where did that come from? Is that accurate? It's a quick read. It's got a lot of good examples in it. It's a trip to the past, even though the basic points it makes are still as valid today. A well-wrapped statistic is better than Hitler's big lie. It misleads, yet it cannot be pinned on you. This book is a sort of primer in ways to use statistics to deceive. It may seem altogether too much like a manual for swindlers. Perhaps I can justify it in the manner of the retired burglar whose published reminiscences amounted to a graduate course in how to pick a lock and muffle a footfall. The crooks already know these tricks. Honest men must learn them in self-defense. Only when there is a substantial number of trials involved is the law of averages a useful description or prediction. How many is enough? That's a tricky one, too. It depends, among other things, on how large and how varied a population you are studying by sampling. And sometimes the number in the sample is not what it appears to be. A remarkable instance of this came out in connection with a test of a polio vaccine a few years ago. It appeared to be an impressively large-scale experiment, as medical ones go. 450 children were vaccinated in a community, and 680 were left unvaccinated as controls. Shortly thereafter, the community was visited by an epidemic. Not one of the vaccinated children contracted a recognizable case of polio. Neither did any of the controls. What the experimenters had overlooked, or not understood, in setting up their project was the low incidence of paralytic polio. At the usual rate, only two cases would have been expected in a group this size, and so the test was doomed from the start to have no meaning. Something like 15 to 25 times this many children would have been needed to obtain an answer signifying anything. Many a great, if fleeting, medical discovery has been launched similarly. Make haste, as one physician puts it, to use a new remedy before it's too late. The guilt does not always lie with the medical profession alone. Public pressure and hasty journalism often launch a treatment that is unproved, 
particularly when the demand is great and the statistical background hazy. So it was with the cold vaccines that were popular some years back, and the antihistamines more recently. A good deal of the popularity of these unsuccessful cures sprang from the unreliable nature of the ailment and from a defect of logic. Given time, a cold will cure itself. If you can't prove what you want to prove, demonstrate something else and pretend that they are the same thing. In the days that follows the collision of statistics with the human mind, hardly anybody will notice the difference. The semi-attached figure is a device guaranteed to stand you in good stead. It always has. You can't prove that your nostrum cures colds, but you can publish, in large type, a sworn laboratory report that half an ounce of the stuff killed 31,108 germs in a test tube in 11 seconds. While you're about it, make sure that the laboratory is reputable or has an impressive name. Reproduce the report in full. Photograph a doctor-type model in white clothes and put his picture alongside. But don't mention the several gimmicks in your story. It's not up to you, is it, to point out that an antiseptic that works well in a test tube may not perform in the human throat, especially after it's been diluted according to instructions to keep it from burning throat tissue. Don't confuse the issue by telling what kind of germ you killed. Who knows what germ causes colds, particularly since it probably isn't a germ at all. In fact, there is no known connection between assorted germs in a test tube and whatever it is that produces colds, but people aren't going to reason that sharply, especially while sniffling. Maybe that one's too obvious and people are beginning to catch on although it would not appear so from the advertising pages. If you should look up the latest available figures on influenza and pneumonia, you might come to the strange conclusion that these ailments are practically confined to three southern states, which account for about 80% of the reported cases. What actually explains this percentage is the fact that these three states required reporting of the ailments after the other states had stopped doing so. Some malaria figures mean as little. Where before 1940 there were hundreds of thousands of cases a year in the American South, there are now only a handful. A salubrious and apparently important change that took place in just a few years. But all that has happened in actuality is that cases are now recorded only when proved to be malaria, where formerly the word was used in much of the South as a colloquialism for a cold or chill. You may have heard the discouraging news that 1952 was the worst polio year in medical history. This conclusion was based on what might seem all the evidence anyone could ask for. There were far more cases reported in that year than ever before. But when experts went back on these figures, they found a few things that were more encouraging. One was that there were so many children at the most susceptible ages in 1952 that cases were bound to be at a record number if the rate remained level. Another was that a general consciousness of polio was leading to more frequent diagnosis and recording of mild cases. Finally, there was an increased financial incentive, there being more polio insurance and more aid available from the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. All this threw considerable doubt on the notion that polio had reached a new high and the total number of deaths confirmed the doubt. So yeah, things like changing definitions, incentives, etc. Kind of reminded me of what we just went through, but take it for what you will. I'll leave all the links in the description below.